Could climate change lead to the collapse of society or a human extinction event? It's an existential question and one that is, as some researchers have described, endlessly underexplored. While much attention is on what happens in a world that's one and a half or two degrees warmer thanks to human activity, research into what happens if the world is three or more degrees is less extensive. One of the researchers asking this question is Dr. Luke Kemp, Research Associate at the Centre for the Study of Existential Risk at the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom. Luke, you and your colleagues say we need a clearer picture on the worst outcomes of climate change. Why is that? Because these are the scenarios that matter most and are the ones that we know least about. When, whenever we try to attempt risk management strategies, we need to base these upon knowledge of the extremes. This is why, for instance, we do high velocity car crashes of new vehicles, or we examine how planes could undergo a catastrophic failure resulting in a crash. It's also why you would take a very different approach to a bet that involved going bankrupt versus one involving losing $5. Consequences matter when it comes to risk. In any good risk management strategy, particularly under uncertainty, requires knowledge of these extremes. Despite their importance, these are, when it comes to climate change, the scenarios we know least about. The IPCC itself has noted that our knowledge of the aggregate impacts of, impact of climate change above three degrees Celsius is quite low. This has also been noted by popular books like The Uninhabitable Earth by David Wells Wells and Our Final Warning by Mark Linus. In both of those books, they talk about how once you get beyond three or four degrees Celsius temperature rise above pre-industrial levels, suddenly the research starts to taper off. I and a team of international researchers had a similar finding. We did text mining reports of the IPCC, and we found that the coverage of three degrees and above was disproportionately low in comparison to its probability, as well as its con consequence, of course. And that's just thinking about temperature rise. And how much warmer we get in the future is only one part of the equation. The other one is how risk could cascade and link together. And right now, the way we do risk assessments in climate change is incredibly simplistic and unrealistic. We essentially look at different impacts and tally them up in isolation. And that is not how the real world works. If you were doing this kind of risk assessment for COVID-19, you would have missed some of the most important risks that characterize the event, such as the potential collapse of healthcare systems and supply chain issues. So when it comes to both warming rates and risk, we don't understand these extremes and we need to. You mentioned the interconnected impacts of climate change and in your paper, which is titled Climate Endgame, Exploring Catastrophic Climate Change Scenarios, you point out that terms like catastrophic, uh, ill-defined, what should a definition look like? We note in the paper that terms like catastrophic, existential threat are often used in a very fuzzy, ambiguous manner. And that's understandable, but it's not helpful if we want to have a scientific and ground discussion about these extreme scenarios. And so we provide not just a definition for global catastrophic risk, but a definition for all of these key terms such as existential risk and extinction risk, for instance. For global catastrophic risk, we define that as the likelihood of a loss of quarter, 25% of global population and the disruption of critical international systems like food within the space of years or decades. So essentially looking at a probability of a really bad event happening at a global scale within a certain time frame. When we talk about catastrophic climate change, we're talking about is climate change a plausible and significant contributor to global catastrophic risk? And this is quite a different and more complex way of thinking about risk. Most people, when they think about catastrophic risk, they tend to think about one particular threat, like is climate change by itself a catastrophic threat? 
it's understandable, but simplistic, and is unfortunately ultimately not a sensible question to ask. Because whether or not climate change is catastrophic depends upon how vulnerable our systems are, how fragile our societies are. A world of four degrees may be one we can adapt to if we live in a world which is equal, cooperative, has low stress on planetary boundaries, and has good ad ad adaptation technologies. By contrast, a world of four degrees may be catastrophic if we have high levels of conflict, polarization, inequality, and the creation of new weapons of mass destruction. Ultimately, when we think about catastrophic risk or extinction risk, we need to think of the overall probability of a catastrophe or extinction happening given a particular world state. And that's a world state in which climate change could be feeding into the overall level of risk. It's a less sexy, more complicated way of thinking about risk, but it's also a far more comprehensive and accurate one. Your point that there's little understanding of what three degrees of warming could look like. The fact is that if no sufficient action is taken to address greenhouse gas emissions, this becomes a very live scenario. How, therefore, do you think institutions like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change or other research organisations, for that matter, can begin putting knowledge of these extreme outcomes? Yeah, so whether we end up with three degrees or above is ultimately a probabilistic question. Even if we do take action, there's still always a tail risk that the Earth system and the climate system is more sensitive to emissions than we expect, and we end up with a high level of warming. But it's also important to bear in mind that what we're asking for here is not just simply an emphasis and an exploration of higher temperature scenarios, but we're also asking for more complex risk assessments, which think about, for instance, how could the impacts of climate change potentially cascade or not into things like a global financial crisis or conflict at higher levels. So it's not just about temperature, it's also about societal fragility. <clears throat> how does one get these actors, such as governments, universities, to pay more attention to this. And first of all, by raising it as an important area of study, which is exactly what we sought to do with this article. Secondly, by articulating why it is actually pivotal to a range of different things, whether it's building resilience and choosing policies, choosing the right carbon price, doing good risk management and decision-making, or considering emergency response options. So things like climate engineering, all these things require knowledge of the extreme cases. And we're hoping that by articulating this rationale, that actually provides an impetus for governments and others to pursue it. And I've already heard from a number of scientists who've read the paper that they've always had similar feelings and they're hoping that this provides the ammunition for them to pitch projects that are gonna look at extreme risks to funders, for instance, and to governments. A lot of it is about shifting the window of what is considered to be acceptable or legitimate research. And I think historically considering and thinking about the very worst case scenarios has often been sidelined as alarmist when it should be part of any sane risk management strategy. And so we're hoping by giving both an articulation as to why we should study these, why they're important, but also a scientific foundation for exploring climate catastrophe. We give all the tools and reasons for both funders as well as governments to hopefully prioritise this going forward in the future. The deteriorating climate situation is quite clear in the current set of IPCC reports, but that's obviously a document handed down by uh, an intergovernmental organisation. What would you say to a person, um, you know, a person on the street about the sorts of questions they should be asking of their own government? Uh, when it comes to climate change and risk and mitigation and what's being done about it? Our climate and game agenda is built on four basic questions. And while it's framed in the context of research article, each of these are really quite simple and can be asked to the average person walking on the street. And these are, could climate change lead to mass extinction level impacts? What are the channels through which the impacts of climate change could lead to mass mortality and morbidity 
what is the potential of climate change to trigger risk cascades, knock-on effects? Or you can ask the alternative question of how fragile are societies to the impacts of climate change? And last, but definitely not least, how does climate change interact with other vulnerabilities and threats in a plausible future? So things like disinformation, inequality, the erosion of other planetary boundaries and new weapons of mass destruction. It's what we call integrated climate catastrophe assessments. And they can also ask their governments, I mean, first of all, do the very obvious things such as eliminating fossil fuel subsidies, but ask their governments to stop thinking about this as either an issue of politics or research and start thinking about it as an issue of risk. And once you do think about this an issue of risk and you think about the extreme risks involved, suddenly the case for mitigating and decarbonizing becomes far stronger. And granted, it's already overwhelmingly strong. We already know that even if we just consider 1.5 or 2 degrees, mitigation and decarbonizing is a completely and utterly sensible and compelling thing to do. Here in Australia, there is increasing talk of insurers not offering insurance policies to some people who live in areas that are prone to flooding or cyclonic activity and other hazardous events that climate change is expected to exacerbate. In the absence of higher level actions to mitigate climate risk, should we then expect smaller local private actors such as these to take action into their own hands? Mm, that's a difficult one. I suspect in some cases, yes. However, when you're looking at large enough impacts, as you've mentioned, it doesn't become profitable or sensible for insurers or reinsurers to get involved. And you may actually be expecting governments then step in as essential insurer of large scale climate damages. And one thing we do raise in the article is the idea of could enough impacts potentially lead to things like the collapse of the reinsurance industry? And that's something which hasn't been explored, but is you know, a legitimate area of concern. One thing I should mention actually, and this is more in regards to the previous two questions, is the role of activism. So one thing we hope this article does is not just simply provide a strong case for looking at extremes in the context of risk assessment, but also it provides a reason to, galvan to further galvanize the public. That when you look at, for instance, the discovery of nuclear winter and the effect, effect that had on public sentiment towards nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament is really quite powerful. And it's hard to draw really clear cause and effect, but it's hard not, but it's also difficult not to see that the discovery that a nuclear war could actually lead to a decade of a nuclear of nuclear winter did not actually make people more concerned and more likely to take to the streets. And that didn't have knock-on effects on the policy. And likewise, the 1.5 degree report back in 2018 also seems to have had a galvanizing effect on public opinion when it comes to climate change. And we're hoping the knowledge of the extremes can do exactly the same thing. So you had a question about um, how can we get governments and others to actually explore these scenarios and think about them? I think one key and potential contributor here is of course, social movements and mobilization. If people are actually out in the streets saying, the obvious things of we want to decarbonize, but also we want to be taking the conservative option and we want to know what the worst cases are, that potentially gives government a good mandate to move forward with both assessing extremes, but also using those to do much more sane risk management about climate change. And ultimately, to me, this isn't just simply about understanding the risks. It's not disaster voyeurism, it's about preventing those risks, whether it be through adaptation resilience measures or hopefully providing an even stronger case for decarbonisation. What would be a takeaway that a person should take from the work that you've been doing? The takeaway is that the extreme risks of climate change are important, they're neglected, they are vital to a host of different 
areas, including risk management. And they are within our grasp to understand and to prevent as well. And we hope that our research agenda provides one avenue for doing so. And importantly, while we don't know the exact picture in detail, we don't know the probabilities, for instance, or the mechanisms through which we could reach a climate catastrophe, there are several plausible reasons for thinking that it could happen in the future. And for these, we go through both the precedent of the past, so the fact that mass that climate change has been involved in all five mass extinction events about the planetary history of Earth, and that even today we still seem adapted to a particular climatic niche of roughly 13 degrees mean annual temperature. We also talk about the potential for knock-on effects, and we talk about the potential for climate change triggering another catastrophe, such as a nuclear war. And finally, we talk about latent risk, climate change impeding our ability to recover from another disaster. Once again, something like nuclear war, or even a far worse pandemic than what we've recently experienced. So all these together give us a, a really plausible, strong reason to take these questions seriously, which is something we haven't done so thus far. We have not taken seriously the question of, could climate change result in human extinction or a global societal collapse? And it is now the time to take those questions seriously and to study them seriously. Luke, thanks for joining us on Cosmos. My pleasure, man.